which I should have done before I did the introductions. But anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Zach and Kristen. And also, um, thank you, uh, Carl Gesh, who's going to be assisting us today. Awesome. Thanks, Kim. So I cannot see the chat or anyone. So I feel like I'm talking into the void, but just bear with me. And Carl, just let me know if there's anything in the chat that we should know about. Um, we'd really love for you guys to engage with us and drop uh, questions, comments in the chat. We plan to leave plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. Um, but I'll just sort of get us started before I pass it over to Zach and let everyone know that the idea for this presentation really came um, from conversations that I've had over the last year um, with counties and from working with the Public Outreach Committee. Uh, we've been working to sort of reform and rebuild over the last several months, and it's been really exciting. Um, I checked before and I saw a lot of the folks who've been helping with that in the chat, so feel free to introduce yourselves or say hi or comment uh, as we are sort of talking about the work. But one of the goals that we identified was to really understand the growing needs, the growing communication needs of our members so that we can help to meet those needs. I think we can all agree that storytelling is important. I've heard folks say that several times throughout the conference. Um, we know that getting the word out about our boots on the ground work can really have a major impact. It can make audiences care, um, and those audiences can include everyone from elected to official, uh, officials to the general public. Uh, but we also know that outreach uh, can be time consuming and that there are funding constraints and time constraints that can present real challenges to those outreach efforts. Uh, so today, Zach and I are going to talk through some of the resources that we've been developing uh, to help make your outreach efforts a little easier. So with that, I will turn it over to Zach and you can take it away and talk about these awesome videos that you've been developing. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Uh, as I said, or as I was introduced, my name is Zach Laughlin. I work for Fond du Lac Lane and Water. I was hired uh, about a year and a half ago as a part of a GLRI grant that we're doing in one of our watersheds. Uh, we're challenging two farmers to do continuous no-till cover crops and low disturbance manure on 225 acres each continuously for three years. And really as the grant is was structured and written it's it's really a social model we're, we're trying to use them as our guinea pigs to try to pioneer a new way and figure out if that those methods will actually work and so i was hired both to work with them but also to share what they're doing and so a large part of that is obviously social media so i wasn't really giving a lot of guidelines um, which I, I like, so I can <laughs> kind of play around and figure out what will work. And so this, I, I guess before I go into the social media, that's only part of what I do. I mean, posting fuel days is another, I got an article published in the newspaper about the project. So those are maybe human and older legacy media forms of uh, idea sharing, I guess you could say but this is the social media piece. So this is what I've been doing the past year and a half. So it'll be general, the first video is a general explanation of the platforms I use. And then the next two videos will be about me talking about kind of my tools and how I, I create the content. Uh, so yeah, Kristen, you can go ahead and play the, the first video. Perfect, I will do that. Facebook is my pretty standard social media platform that I would say I post the most on. Uh, we also get traffic from like LCC members and maybe other people in the county that will share uh, our more popular posts. I found that video and YouTube videos don't get gain a lot of traction in terms of likes or shares for whatever reason. People seem to really like pictures, and especially if you tag other partnering or neighboring organizations, that usually gets the shares going and that gets your likes up. I don't, you don't you shouldn't really do social media posts just simply for 
likes, but that does play a factor. If Facebook's my main platform I use the most, Instagram would be a close second. It, it's similar in a lot of ways that you can post a picture and write some text about what it is you're, you're posting about and you throw it up on their platform. But the cooler part for me, at least, is the story option. I really like Instagram story option because I can regularly post daily occurrences um, that go on in our department that maybe would look not that enticing as a post, but it's just five seconds out of somebody's day, such as posting about the car wash behind our, our building. You can add text and music to make it fun. I try to use this as a way to regularly connect with our followers as opposed to always having to to make a post, but you know that's up to subjective opinion about your strategy. With my drone, Instagram is really nice because it's easy to share video from my drone through my phone right to Instagram. So I do that quite a bit when just... Instagram also allows you to upload videos. They had something called Instagram TV, which they discontinued, I think, in October or November, which is a real bummer because I like that. Um, they still allow videos to be uploaded, but the formatting is tough to, to correct, I guess be the best way to put it, so that it looks looks nice on their platform. So I'll be playing around with that in the future. Twitter is my dark horse platform. Uh, it's probably the least popular, I would guess, but I'm not sure. I use it mostly to make posts that appeal to the broader agricultural and conservation community that's maybe outside Wisconsin. And I also use it extensively to research and figure out what other farmers, researchers, field agents are doing across the country is related to conservation and soil health. YouTube is probably my favorite platform. However, it, it is ambiguous to try to determine who exactly is using or viewing our content. Uh, you get I get a lot of subscribers from India, for instance. For my videos, I tend to do them in vlog style. I do some interviews and then maybe show some footage of like drone footage or pictures to illustrate what the interviewee is talking about. I've done longer storytelling videos, such as our Matthias Lashinsky Award winners and the GLRI project. And I've also done some kind of raw from the field at our field day events, where it's just literally recording whoever's talking. Okay, we can pause and field any questions before we move on. Uh, I've gotten a couple of questions about ADA accessibility, so that'd be the Disabilities Act. Um, actually, a landowner <laughs> brought that up recently. I've never really thought about it too much. After he did mention it, I checked all the YouTube videos and they automatically um, closed caption the content. So I think we're covered there. Someone's asking about Facebook or Instagram. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think that it's, a, it's an issue. I mean, there's thousands of public, if not millions public institutions that use Instagram the same way that I do, as far as I'm aware. Of your social media followers, what do you think is the ratio of conservation professionals to producers? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's it depends on the platform. Um, Facebook, I think, is more of our local Fond du Lac community. I haven't seen many farmers on there. Sometimes a few will will like some of our content. Um, but Twitter, Twitter has more of a has a broader following in terms of farmers and conservation specialists. 
maybe other nonprofits. YouTube, like I said, it's hard to determine who's actually watching the videos. I, like I said, a lot of the people that subscribe to the channel, they're from India um, or some other country. It's kind of interesting. Uh, how does your county handle our archiving platforms for open records request? Uh, our county has, I don't know if it's a software or what it is exactly, but I've signed up using the social, our social media platforms and my email. And it's all registered through, I could dig through my email. I, I forget what it's called, but our HR has worked with us too get it certified and archived. They do, I don't know if Whitney's just responding or asking a question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Do you do any paid promotion with Facebook? I have not yet. No, Whitney has, so she, I think, so maybe she could respond to that. But why don't we move on to the, uh, the, the video. All right, Zach, I'm gonna play our, your camera setup video here. Yep, this is about my camera. Now let's talk about my camera setup. So I use a Canon SL1 camera. Um, it's also known as the Rebel SL, SL1. It's a model originally created in 2013. They've since made a second and third version, which I think the SL3 came out in 2017 or 2018. It's uh, to, to do an analogy, it's not definitely not a 2022 Cadillac Escalade. It's more has more of a, a 2005 Honda Civic vibe. It's a reliable camera. It was at the time rated as having good video quality, which is why I bought it. It does pretty well for pictures too, though you could definitely do better. Uh, I think you can find used Canon SL1s for 200. 50 to 350 dollars um just standard body without the lens sometimes the lens is lens is offered but just to give you a price range of what this camera's worth i believe that you can use your if you have a smartphone a lot of times those pictures um and especially some of the options that keep getting added to with the cameras on the on the phones uh, they do just as nice of job there's some things that I don't like as much. Uh, while the video quality is very high, um, sometimes it doesn't look quite cinematic, which is what I'm looking for. So if you are in fact just using a phone, so here's my iPhone, here's some quick tips on the video quality and look. So if you hit HD, I'm not sure if that's like 1080 or 2.4K, but if you hit HD, it changes the quality to 4K, so you have a more fine-tuned look. And then if you look on the right at the numbers, the numbers indicate frames per second. So 30 is pretty standard if you're just doing a basic uh, video shot. 60 is when you're doing something, trying to videotape something that's moving, or maybe you're trying to do a slow-mo where um, you shoot at 60 and then you edit at 30 to get that the more slow motion look. And then 24 is what is known as the cinematic look. Uh, the image, the video of the combine was shot by my camera in 24 frames per second. And that just captures less uh, footage, you know, obviously per second. And so it just creates that look that we are so used to when watching documentaries or films. So that's a little bit about how to change the quality of your video with your phone. 
So what I've chosen to do to make my situation smoother and simpler, using my camera, I can easily take this SD card and put it into my, my laptop setup and easily pull uh, the files off to use. Now, when it comes to pictures, um, things taken with an iPhone versus my camera, perhaps the quality is very similar and the files are small enough that you can just email them to yourself. But when it comes to video, um, using the SD card makes the process so much simpler. It would be very difficult to figure out how to move a large file from my iPhone to a situation such as Google Drives and then to into the software that I use to edit video. So the SD card just makes it a very simple process. So that's why I've chosen it. But if you're using Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and you have it hooked up to your, your iPhone or your Android, uh, you can do video. Video would work just fine, but it's the video editing process for me that pushes me to use uh, the SD card in my, my camera as opposed to my iPhone. There's that. I don't see a lot of questions, so maybe we could do the camera. Zach, there was one question about whether um, your county paid for the camera or if that's your personal camera. Uh, my personal. All right, I'll start the Canva video for you, Zach. Now let's talk about Canva. Canva is a great tool that I've used for about three years now. It's kind of a poor man's version of Adobe Photoshop. It's very easy to use. Um, it offers a lot of pre-created templates, which you can easily edit, change color, reframe, move different pieces of the template around. It's, it's really awesome. There is a paid option, which gives you more features. And there's also a free option, which is what I use. I will say since I've used both, um, outside of work, I can say in over the three years that I've used it, the free, the capabilities of the free option have greatly improved. So one of the really nice things about Canva is that it's very easy to duplicate slides or creations, I guess would be a better way to put it. So this is my, my thumbnail tab for my YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. So right here, let's click the duplicate page. What I've done is I created this very simple sort of template, which includes um, our logo colors, blue and gold. And anytime I wanna make a new thumbnail, all I have to do is duplicate it, remove the picture, put in a new one, change the title and any the sort of subtitles and boom, it's ready to download and I can use that for YouTube. So that's kind of like a really good short little experiment of showing you what, why I think that Canva is a great tool. Out of all the tools and gadgets and methods I've spoken about today, I'd say that Canva is probably the most valuable both because of its ease of use, but also because it's free. And besides social media posts that you can create with it, you can also create videos, you can create brochures, mailings, newsletters, uh, a lot of different things. So we've created our own soil health application with it. So it's a great tool, it's free, and I really recommend you trying it out. Okay, any further questions? I, there's a lot that I didn't talk about. I mean, here's uh, my drone. I didn't talk about that. It, it takes a lot of time to create those the videos. So 
just didn't get around to it. But I'm willing to talk about any of the other things that go into making videos or pictures. Uh, Carol is saying that if you have the budget to pay for the, uh, the advanced version of Canva. Yeah, I would generally agree. It would be worth the investment, maybe 120 bucks a year. Yeah, thanks Zach so much for making those videos. Uh, folks might want to rewatch those. Um, so I can let you all know that they live on our public outreach committee page, uh, which you can find on our website. Um, and these videos are a really great example of what we're hoping to do in the future with the public outreach committee, which is to develop resources, support, or training opportunities that we can offer to counties. Um, you can always email us if you have ideas or things that you would like to see. Um, the Public Outreach Committee has also been working to put together a really fantastic survey that will help us take an inventory of some of your current practices. So maybe you're already using social media or you have a really great YouTube channel or you're working to develop uh, featured projects. Um, so if you haven't taken that survey, we send it out to all of our county cons via the listserv. So make sure that you guys do that. I checked this morning and we already have 36 responses, which is really fantastic. Um, and that is going to help us sort of drive our work as we think about the needs of our conservation community. And so I wanted to just go through for a few minutes and talk about some of the other resources that are available um, on the Public Outreach Committee page. So if you'll scroll down, once you're on that page, you'll see that we have a few resources here. Um, and I'm just going to talk about three of them quickly. Um, Hootsuite, Grammarly, and Unsplash. So let's get into it. Um, Hootsuite is a really great platform that I have used uh, in the past, and I think it's really successful. It's come a long way. Um, and this is a really great platform that will help you to maintain a schedule of when to post your social media content. Um, I know that we are all very busy and that time can be one of the things uh, that folks struggle with when it comes to social media, especially. So you should definitely try Hootsuite. Uh, this platform helps you schedule posts across all of your social media networks in just a few clicks. Um, you can see here on the screen, let me just make sure you guys can see my mouse. Hopefully you guys can see this, but you can see that once you uh, sign up with your Hootsuite account and connect uh, your social media, it gives you this really awesome calendar where you can keep track of scheduled posts. Um, the free account is really great. Uh, you can have one user, you can connect up to two social media accounts, and you can do five scheduled messages. So this would be really great if you have upcoming events that you want to post about and you already know the date, you can definitely schedule those out. Um, or if you want to sit down on Monday or Friday and schedule several posts for the next week, um, it's a really great opportunity to do that without having to sort of return to the platform every time you want to post. When you sort of start to schedule a post, it's really great. This is something that they've definitely improved um, in recent years, but you can actually see exactly how your post will look on the platform. So if you're adding photos, uh, you can see how that will look. Uh, you can also tag other counties or organizations, and you can actually schedule for later, like we just mentioned, or you can do the post now option, which is a really great time saver. Um, so instead of having to put, log into both Facebook and Twitter, you can sort of do it all here and hit post now, and that will share the content across your platforms. So I would definitely recommend trying Hootsuite if you want to do some time management on your social media accounts. The next platform that I'll talk a little bit about is Grammarly. It's a grammar checker and proofreading tool that can really help to improve your overall writing. And I should warn you guys that prior to my role at Wisconsin Land and Water, I spent five years as a freshman composition instructor. Um, and so this was a program that I always recommended to my students. Um, 
it, and I've used it myself, uh, it can be really difficult to proof your own work. So this is a really fantastic tool. Um, you will sign up for a free account and you'll access all of this um, online. And it works super easily. You just upload your document, your Word doc here, and it will actually sort of pull through. And on our next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what that editing process looks like. Um, and you might be thinking that, well, Microsoft Word does this, and it does indeed. But one thing that I think is great about Grammarly is that if you're using Google Chrome, you can actually sort of add this to Google Chrome, and it will proofread all over the place for you. So it will check your emails. It will check Google Docs. Um, I like to use it when I'm creating content for the website because it will also check that. Um, and it also does um, a little more work than Microsoft Word because it is actually a little more instructive. So it can flag potential issues in the text or make content context specific suggestions that can help you not only with grammar and spelling, but with issues like wordiness or style or punctuation, even your tone. It's just a really fantastic sort of teaching tool when it comes to um, writing. So here you can see that it will flag any of your misspellings, which is really great. Um, it will also check to make sure your word usage is correct. I love to add commas. It's my favorite punctuation. So I will drop them all over the place. Um, it will also sort of talk about your conciseness and let you know if you have repeated words. Um, so here you can see can possibly may be a little redundant. And I put this one in there. Uh, I always get that I don't have much of a Mississippi accent, but if you email or talk to me long enough, you'll eventually hear me say might could, which would definitely be flagged by Grammarly. So again, another really great free tool that can just um, help you sort of check things. Uh, you can also create your own user dictionary, uh, which is really great. So for example, interceding is a word that I use a lot that it doesn't register. So you can really create your own dictionary and use words and add in things that are relevant to your own communications. And then the last one that I'll touch briefly on is Unsplash. And this is a source of freely usable images. Uh, it includes a lot of really beautiful wildlife and landscape pictures. And so this is a really great and free alternative to Adobe stock. Um, so for example, if you were working on a publication or a post about pollinators, you can type in pollinators and it will pull up some absolutely stunning images. I, when I found this, I was honestly amazed that it was free, uh, but it is more of a community of photographers who very generously upload their own work um, that is free for you. So you can check out that license there. I would definitely recommend it. I really love it because there are some great location specific images, especially for Wisconsin. So if you type in something like Wisconsin nature, you'll see tons of images. I mean, hundreds of images. It's really, really impressive. And you can see that a lot of them um, are detailed, right? So we can see the date that it was taken, right? So this is from 2019. We get a nice location. So the Dales of the Wisconsin River and a little description here. And then you would just download this photo and you have an absolutely stunning image of the river here. So this is again, really, really great. If you are looking for stock images or things for publications, I would really recommend it. Um, there are some local photographers um, in Madison and in other areas that share pretty frequently and update. So you can see certain areas throughout the different seasons. So I would definitely recommend checking that out if you are looking for photos. And then I just wanna briefly touch, we talked a little bit about tools that you can use to promote uh, your work, but I wanna talk about Wisconsin Land and Water and how we are also another tool that you can use in a way and some of these opportunities and how we can help sort of get your story out. Um, so a few of these that we have here are our conservation and action stories, formerly known as success stories. Uh, we wanted to sort of broaden that out and really show the boots on the ground work that's happening. 
Um, so we actually have a way that you can submit these to um, our website. And I think that chat or that link is going to be dropped in the chat. But these are really fun. And I absolutely love writing these stories. Um, it gets me out into the field and really learning about the work that's happening. Um, and we have several places that we can then sort of put these stories, right? So you can see here that we can feature them on our website. Uh, we also have some publications that we do, including our newsletter here called The Notes. So this was a really great story that I worked with on Andy and the Clean Farm families out in Ozaki County. And so I heard that that was happening and went out and did a farm tour and it was really great. And so I was able to come back and then sort of write that up and share it um, in our newsletter. So if you have projects that you're working on or if you've been awarded a grant or if there's an upcoming event, reach out. Um, and it's definitely something that we can help sort of think about where we can put this. Um, we also offer um, conservation clips, which is a bi-weekly sort of curation of top headlines that are related to conservation. Uh, we always try to include uh, county stories that we see. We collect these uh, from local news sources, um, other national news. We just do a really great search. And so I don't know if Isabel is here. I hope she is this morning, but she's our intern. So feel free to say hi in the chat. Isabel does a great job every week of putting this together. Um, so if you're ever featured in one of those local papers or if there's a news story or something that you'd like for us to share, you can also send it in um, either to me or to Isabel and we can make sure that we include it. Uh, this has a really broad subscriber um, list. Uh, so this goes out to all sorts of people. Um, journalists are on there, um, other conservation professionals and organizations. So it's another really great way that we can sort of promote the work that's happening um, in the counties. And so then I'll just wrap up here really quickly. And I wanted to close out with this uh, photo of Aldo Leopold, uh, because as much as he was a conservationist and a scientist, he was also a dedicated writer. Um, and what an impact that telling him telling his stories has really had on so many of us here. Um, I actually reread the book um, after I moved to Wisconsin and started working with Wisconsin Land and Water and had so many of you all tell me that it was one of your absolute favorites. And the copy that I happened to purchase had an amazing introduction uh, by Barbara Kingsolver, who's another one of my favorite writers. And in reflecting on Leopold's work, uh, she said something that really stuck out to me. And she said that the essays are short, bright gems of prose. Today, they might be blog posts recounting a day or an hour on a farm in Sauk, Wisconsin. And so I thought that comparison of thinking about the way that these stories might be told through blog posts or social media or videos uh, was a really great way to sort of think about why telling these stories are important. Um, you know, it really helps to build that sense of community and all the sort of things that are so important uh, to getting that work out. So let's tell your story. You can join the committee, you can take the comm survey, you can submit a story idea, or you can just get in touch with us. Uh, we would love to hear from you and know what you're doing. And so I will put up this code here. And Carl, if we have any questions in the chat, we'll open it up. We'd love to hear from everybody. Yeah, reminder to everyone to please enter your questions in the chat. There's just one so far, Kristen. Is there a cost for Unsplash? No, it is absolutely free to use. You just go to unsplash.com and type it in. Um, you don't have to create an account. I do because I like to sort of create uh, channels and folders where I can save images. And so it's a, a really great tool, but totally free, uh, beautiful high res images. All right, a couple more questions coming in. We struggle with our existing workloads and being able to justify taking the time to do sufficient outreach. Are there any counties that are able to grant fund in outreach staff? If so, are you willing to share what entity would fund that kind of position? Is that for me or for Kristen? Zach, Could I be think for that either be, of you. Yeah, Zach, I think that might be a good one for you or actually I will stop sharing 
And if there are any other folks, if you need that uh, QR code, let me know and I can put it back up. But if there are other folks who want to weigh in or if you want to turn on your cameras, love to hear from you. Uh, I don't know anything about, I mean, unless you want to do a GLRI project, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's how I'm funded. I, I really don't know. I mean, to be honest, all you need to do some outreach is phone and the apps of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you're using to start building a platform. You don't need to use a DSLR camera and have an extensive video editing process. I mean, there's something called uh, Adobe Rush that you can get as an app on your phone and you can edit videos right on, on your phone. I just, I don't know, I, I prefer using the video editing software that I, I use. Hey, hey, Zach, this is Paul. Hey, Paul. Can I, can I add a little bit? Sure. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, Zach's position within our department is currently grant funded. The GLRI afforded us to take an avenue um, doing outreach like we've never done before. Uh, it's, it's obviously highly valuable. It's a different skill set as you're kind of hearing than um, traditionally what you would find in the land conservation department, but it's important as obviously has been proven um, through Zach's work. Um, it is grant funded. We, you know, my goal is to, to fund it within the department beyond the grant, you know, but as you all know that those are grants and money is finite. So we're working on that right now. Um, equipment, as he mentioned, is you can keep it as simple as you want, um, get as complicated as you want. So we're kind of learning through this just like everybody else is. This is a new thing for us as well. So um, we're kind of learning just like everybody else. But it is the one thing that I would emphasize is the different skill set than traditionally what you find in a land conservation department. And it is an investment into your storytelling of your department and what you're trying to do and get the message out there. Um, so that's what I would add to this. Thanks. Next question I think is for Kristen. Does the note go out broader than just in Wisconsin? Um, so yes, actually, uh, anyone uh, who sort of comes across our website, we have lots of signups uh, for the note. So we have a very broad readership for this. Um, I know that we have organizations from other states uh, who subscribe and get the note. Um, we often, um, and so we'll send that out to folks. So yeah, it does actually go beyond Wisconsin and that's something that we're hoping to sort of expand as we move forward. So, yep. Thank you. And another question, is there a cost to use Grammarly? So Grammarly, uh, like most of these platforms has a free version and a paid version. Um, I always just use the free version. I've never actually paid for it um, and it works pretty well. Um, and I think for mostly what I imagine we'd be doing, which is, you know, maybe writing stories or you're doing press releases or working on a publication, um, the free version works really great. Um, it'll catch most of the things like uh, your wordiness or your conciseness. Um, and the paid version is really looking more for things like tone, um, or, or bigger items uh, that you can really track. So I would just recommend trying out the free one. Yep, it seems to, to do the job fairly well. Thanks. Another question in the chat. We get asked to share success stories at multiple levels, locally, DATCAP, et cetera. Is there a way to collaborate as a state to have a single location or platform to tell the conservation story? Yeah, Amy, that's a fantastic idea. Um, and we actually do uh, work with DATCAP. I don't know if Corrine's on this morning, but I know she sends out um, a survey that sort of asks you all to share examples um, and collaboration. And so I'm actually able to see that with Corrine and, and work through uh, pursuing some of those stories. Um, and so that's one reason why we sort of added some of those questions into that survey. And then we also have the one spot on our website. So I know that that's sort of two, but we're definitely uh, looking for ways that we can sort of better collaborate uh, statewide to really share and elevate those stories. So that's a fantastic suggestion. Uh, I could add, I know uh, Minnesota's NRCS does some collaborations with um, local like, government agencies like us to do videos in 
Uh, there's a woman, I think she's through UW Madison named Jenny Seifert, who started something called One Good Idea. And it's about trying to take um, the different media and videos that conservation efforts have created and centralize them in, in one location. So there's someone working on something similar to what you're saying. You'll have to send me that contact info, Zach. <laughs> Oh, yeah. This is Paul again, one more time. One more thing that I would add um, about the whole role of doing outreach, whether it be social media, is just the, the people that you reach. Um, there's a lot more farmers on social media than what, uh, what it would appear. Um, there's a lot of them on YouTube um, searching out, so that's a great avenue to explore. Um, I find that farmers are always kind of searching out new ideas on YouTube, especially, but Facebook in general is a is a pretty big one to just try and get messaging out there but from a county conservationist getting the message out there for our department there's people um internally in the county county board supervisors lccs um uh administration um follow us on social media so it's it's a great avenue to be able to get your message out there and follow what you're doing in real time and there you're reaching people that um, normally your department may not necessarily even see face to face all the time. So um, it's been great to have people on the county board follow us along that aren't even part of uh, LCC and, and getting the information out there. I guess maybe my question is, would anyone like to share success that they've been doing with social media? Because like, it's just like farming. I mean, everyone has a different opinion on how it's done and whatnot, and how I do it is not exactly how somebody else, somebody else sees it. So I saw a few people chirping in in the chats. I didn't know if anyone else wanted to share. This is Greg from from Outagamie County. Um, yeah, I I just mentioned in the chat that I agree with Paul. Um, you know, I think anything we can get out there just expands what we do and gets it out to so many more people that you know. I think we get a lot of. Geez, I didn't even realize that the county did that or offered that. Um, you know, the farmers that we work with a lot all get what we do and what we provide. Um, you know, but I think a lot of the general public and you get it all the time, you know, they assume that DNR is doing that or, you know, somebody else is doing that and they don't realize that, you know, that's what we do. You know, that's the service that the county provides. So I think the more we can share that, um, the better. And, you know, like Paul said, county board members, you know, you've got your LCC members and then the rest of the county board and, you know, any opportunity you can get to share with the rest of the county board beyond your committee um you know just garners that much more support for what your department's doing and and um you know when you have asks of the county board to expand your program or add positions you know you they know what you're doing yeah thanks Thanks, Greg, so much. Uh, and I'll just add before we close, I saw Kim turned her camera back on. So I <laughs> guess that means we're getting close, close to Got the about end. a minute left. Yeah, but Katie uh, dropped in a really great thing that the outreach committee really wants to help uh, the counties do this work, right? Do outreach, do education, do communications. Uh, you know, well and efficiently. So we would really love it if you all could join us for our next uh, outreach committee meeting, which is going to be scheduled sometime in April. Um, so feel free to pop in. We definitely need to hear from you so that we know what your needs are, so that we know what help you need, so that we can sort of develop those resources or templates uh, to really make outreach uh, easier and go smooth uh, for all of you. So thanks so much. All right, right on time, Kristen. Um, it is 9.45, so I wanna thank Zach and Kristen um, for your amazing presentations. I even learned um, some new tips on how to do videoing. So 
Um, thank you all for that great presentation. Carl, thank you for your help with questions. Um, feel free to stick around and um, ask some more questions. Our next session coming up will begin at 10 a.m. and it will be floodplain management workshop. So thank you all for um, participating and um, we'll see you soon.